All right, give me just one second here, guys, and we'll get the show underway. Just make sure everything's set up and that we're off and running. Check out our live stream. For some reason, my laptop is getting a lot of latency right now. Which is what I watch the stream on so I can see the comments because I don't like doing it at the same time. Let's turn the mic volume up a little bit too. All right, so it looks like we are up and running. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to episode number 48 of my weekly Gem Game Review series. I am your host, Chris Gogolin, back as always. Uh, just fresh off the Match Play Championships, which just ended uh, a couple days ago in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Great event. Uh, thank you again to all 47 players that were able to attend. Uh, unfortunately, we had three people who had to drop out from the tournament and uh, came up a little short of our goal. And uh, hope to have more next year, and uh, we'll look, certainly start looking at potential dates for that in, uh, in 2020. But... Uh, Hey, knock it off. Sorry. Cat's being uh, very curious, trying to basically get through the blinds out, and out the window. But, uh, yeah, so, and uh, we're just a few minutes away here from the end of the April OCS month. Uh, like we said, the server time, you can't quite see the clock because my head's in the way. The server clock there is set to uh, GMT, so it's four hours ahead right now because they don't do daylight savings time from where I am in the East Coast. Um, so it's about 11.30 there, so at uh, in about 27 minutes, that'll kick us over into May, and then the May OCS will begin, so let's take a quick peek at the April standings. Doesn't look like any of this is going to change. You're going to have Silver Glen with this perfect 12-0. and 0. Congrats, Justin, on a outstanding month. And it uh, looks like Greg Shaw is going to finish in second at 11-1 with a very high opponent's win percentage. A couple of these guys came up just short here at 10-2. And, two. and uh, Charlie's got one game left. If he can squeeze it in, the best he could do would be 10-2 and two as well. That would at least move him you know, up the standings and leaderboard a little bit. Um, but plenty of people still got their minimum number of games in uh, to get their foil for the month. The 8 was all that was required to get one copy of the foil. Uh, huge. You got you got half hour. Get get game number eight in here. Um, Santh, you got 30 minutes to get two games in. Doesn't look promising. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, still plenty of people playing, and uh, a few guys who just didn't have time to get much uh, many games in or any games in this month. But uh, looking forward, the May one is already opened and up and running. If you are not part of the season pass, feel free to. Uh, go to the PC forums. There's a section on there. We'll get to that. We'll show you how to get there real fast. Uh, you just go to the for the main page, to the online championship, and there's a little thing here that says May registration, and you click that. It tells you what you need to do, how to get to the link from the store. Costs you ten dollars for ten, twelve games, competitive Star Wars. You guys know the rules and how it works. And. Uh, all that stuff will be there. Uh, I know a couple people have uh, paid today, so I'll get them added here when I finish the show this evening. And uh, if you haven't bought the season pass, this would be how you get in for just the month. Um, and that'll kick off here in just a few minutes. <laughs> Too busy playing Arena this month. Yeah, yeah, that Arena game is pretty handy, that uh, Magic Arena. Plus, they just had their pre-release the same weekend. Uh, you know, we had our match play championship. So I'm sure you gotta, you know, complete your quests and get your gold for your new packs. Um, but uh, you know, plenty of uh, of Star Wars OCS going on. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I I have to say, you know, it's been two days, and uh, I'm still not tired of hearing that, Dan. So uh, thank you for for mentioning that as well. One of the other things uh, for those of you not uh, watching, uh, who missed some of the live stream at the uh, Match Play Championship, we're just gonna enlarge this a little bit. If you can see over my left shoulder here, there's this very large trophy sitting on my bookshelf behind me, which I'm going to reach behind and grab so you guys can get a closer look at this. Uh, this says Hall of Fame. 
and this was an incredible moment for me uh, and for Matt Sokol, who was also inducted into the Hall of Fame. Um, Matt had the uh, dubious distinction of being inducted first and was caught completely by surprise by the whole thing. So his response was a lot more emotional, uh, uh, as you uh, could expect. And uh, I had about, you know, 30, 40 seconds because as I saw them bringing the trophies up, I saw that there were two of them. And then when, you know, Scott starts talking and doing his thing and then calls up Matt and Matt loses his, you know, stuff. Uh, and, uh, oops, dragged the wrong one. And, uh, you know, starts losing it. He, uh, you know, then gives his little speech and... I kind of had this feeling that the second one was going to be for me. I don't know, just this gut feeling that I had. So I started trying to compose myself and pull it and rein it in a little bit. And uh, and that's where, uh, you know, my my presentation came across as a little bit more composed. I still look like crap because I wasn't expecting it at all. Um, you know, if I had known, I probably wouldn't have worn, you know, sweats and a, uh, <laughs> a old T-shirt or something, you know. Uh, and my jets zip up. I've been like, okay, you know, let me put on like an actual like my PC polo that I have um, that I was planning on on wearing on Sunday, but uh, I might have worn it a little sooner. But that was a tremendous honor and a tremendous achievement, and I'm very grateful to the community um, and for all the advocates and everything like that for. Uh, you know, bestowing upon me that honor, and uh, I, you know, I've been been talking about it for two days, and uh, yeah, still, it's it's still a great and amazing thing. You know, uh, a couple people asked me to sign cards for them uh, on Sunday after the event, and uh, I had to slap that H O F after my signature because uh, you know it's a pretty cool thing. But I don't want to. I could spend an hour talking about that, but I, I don't want to spend a whole hour talking about that. Um, there's some other stuff we got going on to talk about from the match play championship. Was the wife happy? I brought her home two trophies. Absolutely. She was ecstatic. Um, and uh, what Dan is referring to here, um, Dan, during the MPC, one of the things I also want to talk about, was doing side interviews with a lot of the players. And those are all, a lot of these have been uploaded to the PC YouTube page already. You can see all of Dan's here. I believe they are also on, uh, they're on his individual Twitch because he was doing these separate while we were doing the live stream. He was pulling players in throughout the room. So these were on Dan's Twitch page, which I believe there is a link to now on the PC Twitch page if you just scroll down a little bit. Um, and there are um, about uh, a dozen that have been uploaded here so far um, there's also a highlight that i added and moved over because well you know um, of the hall of fame inductions uh queso sauce gets an award at the beginning uh, of this and then there's matt sokol's hall of fame announcement and induction and then mine uh at the end of that but uh, there's a number of interviews here uh with some uh great you know players and personalities um i haven't had a chance to watch all of them but i've watched a few of them and they're, you know they're pretty interesting and entertaining um you know Jerry, Chris, me, Lenny, uh, Eric Hunter, playing in his first Star Wars event in uh, 12 years, 13 years, um, which was awesome. Um, Danny Lamar, who's a newer player to the community, um, being interviewed. Mike Kessling, who we've all watched grow up. You know, uh, he was always the younger one, who's always a few years younger than all of us. So he was like our younger kid brother, who's now you know 20 years later a, a grown man. Um, as much as Mike can grow, um, but yeah, there's some great interviews here that uh, that Dan has has exported over, and will continue. There's a few more that he has uh, to do as well, and uh, some other games. Dan was also streaming the consolation event bracket, the final four of that, because um, you can't stream simultaneously from two different sources um, on Twitch. So we had uh, the PC page was streaming the main event, and uh, we had a separate camera set up that was streaming some of the con the consolation event bracket, and that was going directly to Dan's uh, Twitch page. Thank you again, Dan, very much for flying out strictly all the way from California, 3,000 miles across the country. Didn't play a game of Star Wars all weekend. Was doing, uh, well, maybe you might have played after hours, but uh, you know, was there just on a volunteer capacity. Uh, doing all the interviews and a lot of the, the the 
other streaming and stuff like that. And uh, we very much appreciate that, Dan. And thank you for coming out for that. So, um, so what Dan asked me in chat was, was my wife happy? Because every time I go to a Star Wars tournament, my, my wife always says, you know, hey, I love you, have a great time, and bring me home a trophy. Uh, and that is always the plan. And, uh, you know, if you, in, uh, you know, I've got two interviews here. Uh, the second one, the one he hasn't uploaded, he does ask me that question, and I do explain that a little more. But, uh, yeah, I, she was very happy and thrilled with that trophy. Uh, and then I did pick up another one along the way for making the final four of the MPC as well, which was ultimately won by this guy, Chris Kelly, right there. Uh, and there's his interview, which happened, I believe this is earlier in the day. Um, this is like between like rounds two and three. Um, and then there's probably a second interview with Chris, because I think Dan went back and interviewed the final four again at like the end of the day. Um, so you know, get people's reactions before, uh, through the day as they're going, and then to find out, like, hey, your day worked out the way you thought it would. Um, but the match play championship, we'll pull up the bracket real fast here. Uh, it was a pretty pretty great time. There you go, Chris Kelly. Uh, he beat Tom Kelly in the finals. Uh, Brian Fred was the other finalist, along with myself. Uh, certainly some interesting upsets along the way. Um we had a couple of two seeds go out kind of early and shake things up a little bit. Um, you know, Bill Kafer made a nice little run from the seven seed, picking up one of those upsets. Uh, the other one was Jan, who picked up, uh, you know, he, he held ground here and then picked up an upset over Steve uh, and made a nice little move there and uh, narrowly won our game, if not for sure. Some, some bad luck on his part. Uh, he certainly probably uh, could have pulled out at least one of those games. Um, in the particular matchup I'm referring to, it was his black son. I was playing EBO. His first turn, he activates six force. He goes to use the black sun sites text to deploy a black sun agent because he wants to go get Vigo so he can get his other locations out. And the only agent in his in his reserve deck was Guri. So he had to spend all six of his force to deploy Guri because she was a legal target, which means he didn't get any of his sights. He missed, he used his once per game pull, and he also couldn't pay the two force with shadows to get the 2-0 sight. So he was then activation, gained no activation on his first turn, and uh, that let me kind of springboard ahead of him, and he uh, was not able to catch up from that. So that uh, was a very rough start. Uh, for Jan, and you know, if he doesn't miss that poll, obviously that game goes uh, incredibly uh, different. But you know, when you are playing in a field or a tournament like this with this level of competition, um, s sometimes you have to get those lucky bounces. You know, you talk about you know teams in the NCAA tournament or you know the NFL playoffs and things like that. You just need that one magical little thing, you know, the deflected pass or that shot that, you know, just gets over the guy's outstretched hand or whatever it happens to be. Or, you know, it bounces off the rim and hits the backboard and then kisses back in to make that last second shot. Um, you just need those little things to go your way in order to uh, make it sometimes uh, for, for us mere mortals, um, you know. Uh, that, that's kind of the things that you need to happen. So uh, congrats again to Chris Kelly on winning this event, picking up some player of the year points, and we'll see uh, if Chris continues to build on that this summer. Uh, upcoming other major events. Uh, if you're in North America, you've got one left this year. That's North American Continentals, also known as the John Anderson Memorial Tournament, Minneapolis, Minnesota, late August. Start booking your travel plans for that now. Flights are still pretty cheap to Minnesota. Um or maybe may even be within driving distance if you're out in the Midwest. Um, if you like international travel, there's two events left, uh, both of them in Europe. You've got the European Championship coming up at the end of July, right around, uh, I think that's Bastille Day, which would be a French holiday. Uh, but that'll be in the Netherlands. So if you flew into Paris or worked your way back through there, you could work something out there. And then you've got the World Championships uh, towards the end of September here in Germany. And uh, looks like there's already about 30 people who have committed, most of them European, but there is a, fair, a bit of a, uh, a Team USA kind of thing going on here, and uh, it seems like that might be growing. That's what a lot of people were talking about at the Match Play Championship was, uh, 
you know, trying to get more American players to make the trip over and uh, try and be strong and represent and, uh, you know, take home the, the, the European trophy. You know, they've, uh, the Euros have come over to America and they've won the world championship on our turf. And uh, we'd like to return the favor and go to Europe and, uh, and, and win the, the championship on their turf. So. <sighs> so seating for the MPC is always uh, a coin toss in terms of uh, who's going to sign up and whatnot. So even, you know, trying to figure out where people are going to fall for next year, you don't even know who's going to be there next year. There could be 10 other players who weren't here this year, and there could be, you know, 10 guys who came this year who aren't able to make it next year. So we don't even start looking that ahead. Um, and then we have to figure out when we want to do that again, uh, coordinating with Worfs regarding uh, the Endor Grand Prix and the Match Play Championships. I know the weather was a lot better. It was a little windy, uh, a little rainy uh, Friday, Saturday uh, in New Jersey, but that's certainly a lot better than snow. So the uh, the dance competition uh, <laughs> was, was a little bit much. Um, for those of you not at the event, there were, I don't know, a couple hundred uh girls between 8 and 14 in various groups doing dance competitions and it was like like you know popping and locking and that kind of dance it wasn't like you know ballet or you know those types of classes or you know a cheerleading competition or something it was uh you know rhythmic dancing i don't know what you call it So as I said, on the Star Wars YouTube page, you'll find all of Dan's interviews, and eventually the uh, Match Play Championship games will end up here shortly as well. Uh, as you can see, there are a plethora of other videos, though. Uh, we've got all the Endor Grand Prix ones from January up there. Um, there was a weird thing this year, and I mentioned this on the forums, with Twitch. For some reason, our Twitch stream kept getting interrupted and recycling like every hour on the dot. So... In the match play format, games take an hour, and up to an hour and 15 minutes, and then there's usually some dead time in between games and things like that. So almost every hour file contains halves of different games. So now we have to do a little work to stitch them together and export them over to uh, the YouTube page. That's just going to take a little longer. It's not just a straight, uh, quick export the way it normally is um, from from Twitch. So Appreciate you guys bearing with us. Um, we'll get that over there in a couple days, um, probably throughout the week. By the weekend, I should have all that, uh, at least some of that work done and start getting some of those games over. And um, Dan's going to continue to export the uh, Constellation games as well. So there'll be plenty of content for you guys to watch on the PC's YouTube page. Uh, up to 471 subscribers now, which is awesome. Um, keep them coming. Tell your friends. Get back into the game. Great way to learn is to watch other people playing. And uh, that's why I do my show every week. So, But that's what's going on in the world of Star Wars. And then obviously we've got the May OCS about to kick off here in just a few minutes. Doesn't look like we'll have any games going on in the lobby just yet. Oh, people are trying to squeeze in that last minute game. You just have to start the game before the timer expires. So if someone will pick, start this game... Uh, here in the next uh, nine minutes. This will still count for April. But in the meantime, we'll go ahead and we'll jump over to our uh, queued up game review. This was a game that took place a couple weeks ago between Apollyon and Hutch. It is Hunt Down versus QMC. Uh, we don't uh, see a whole lot of QMC. It's a uh, it's one of those decks that puts a lot of a, a decent amount of cards on the table. It has some very good mechanics with uh, with keeping your eyes out uh, or keeping the Empire out forever and uh, and Belden's Eye. Uh, two great virtual, oh, this isn't a virtual card, but uh, two great mechanics that really uh, help the, the deck get the fuel that it needs. We'll highlight these. Belden's Eye, uh, independent starships are harder to hit. Who cares? 
Quiet Mind and Colony on table. Simultaneously deploy unique starfighter and matching pilot for minus one force each from your hand and or reserve deck. So both the ship and the pilot are both minus one, so minus two total, and you don't even have to match them up. They could both be in your reserve deck. They could both be in your hand, uh, or one of each. And uh, you can go find the matching piece of it. As long as it's not in your force pile, you're fine. Uh, most people usually use this with Hark Seth and the Overseer, which is pretty solid power and uh, goes down nice and cheap. And then they'll play some other cheap guys on Cloud City to do the quick flip because keeping your eyes out for e or keeping Empire out for he wants to keep your eyes open, which is the uh, other virtual card. But this one just requires you to control two Cloud City sites and occupy the system, and then you flip your objective, and then it can't flip back. Um, so you're stuck on so you're on the seven side for the rest of the game, and QMC has some pretty good benefits on the seven side. It does lose the ability to pull its sights other than the docking bay. Now you can still, you know, you uh, once per turn search your force pile, take any one card into hand, so you can get your sights out that way if you have to. But you kind of want to try and pull at least one or two, at least two or three of those sights rather um, before you flip. So you don't have a couple. So you don't have a bunch of zeros floating around in your deck. Typically, QMC decks will run 20 to 22 characters. So your destiny is already poor enough as it is. Drawn a lot of those. I mean, some of they're aliens and things. So usually they have better destiny numbers, uh, threes, a couple of fours. But um, yeah, I think Charlie did play QMC. So QMC was a deck that was in the top eight uh, of the match play championship. And, uh, yeah, there were quite a variety of decks played. Um, you know, you had Old Allies, you had uh, EBO, you had Ralops, um, there was a Hitco, there's always a Hitco, uh, or a Throne Room, and, uh, you know, um, Map was pretty big, uh, which decks that, you know, you would expect to see. Decks that we featured here on uh, on previous shows. Um, I think even an ISB. I think is what Brian Fred was using was ISB. So uh, there was a good variety and a good way to make it. And, uh, you know, me personally, I played EBO and MAP. Two strong decks that don't have a lot of expensive cards. You know, one of the things we see on the forums is people talking about, you know, the barrier to entry. Like, oh, I want to get into the game, but I don't want to buy five Jedi Lukes at 100 bucks a piece. You don't need to, you know. A lot of decks like Old Allies, like MAP, like EBO, like even ISB, they don't use a lot of the expensive versions of, of main characters. Now, a deck like Huntdown definitely does. A deck like QMC, not very expensive. Um, you know, looking at his opening hand here, okay, Rebel Leadership, that's like a $14 card. Uh, you might need two or three copies of that, but it's not a $100 Jedi Luke. Um, you know, Leia's like six or seven bucks. Radis goes over a common. Mirax is two bucks. This is a 50 cent common. Um, some of this other stuff here, you know, Wackling's like a, I mean, Wackling goes in every, a lot of light side decks. I won't say every light side deck, but uh, Wackling's one of those staple cards that you buy one of and you just move it from your deck because it's, you're never going to have it floating in the deck. Usually it's, you're going to start it almost every game. So. And salute you played set your course. Yeah, see, so there were a variety of decks. Uh, deck diversity right now is probably at its all-time high. And I'm sure when the deck lists get posted and we go through and count and do all the numbers, you know, 50 people playing in this tournament, normally, you know, you'd see at least one, there's always that one clear deck that people think is the best that there's probably 10 or 12 copies of. You know, if you go back and look at Worlds last year, 20 to 25 percent of the field was playing Agents of the Black Sun because it was by far the best dark side deck in the tournament. Uh, and to counter that, uh, 20 to 25 percent of the field was playing either Throne Room or Hitco because um, it was determined that light side mains had a pretty good shot at beating Black Sun, especially if you played, you know, if you matched them with, you know, four or five senses of your own. Um, typically, Throne Room fared better with the ability to go first I mean, and kind of put the pressure on them a little bit. But, you know, it was a very, you know, dominant field and deck diversity wasn't quite as high. I'm sure when you look at the numbers from the match play championship, that's going to be a lot different. Uh, the Endor Grand Prix, other than like, I think one deck, there were 25 people there at the tournament. There was like one deck that had like four people playing it. And then I think everything else was like one or two of. And there were like 12 different decks that were all represented. So 
Um, and I think we're going to see those kind of similar numbers from the match play championship. Um, so it's a great time to get into the game or get back into the game uh, if you've taken a little break off you know, from it and uh, you don't need to jump in and buy all the expensive cards right away to, uh, to still be competitive. So let's take a look at this QMC deck. So Hutch is running 12 card hunt down, not starting any effects, used surface defense, starting interrupt. Uh, that gives him four extra cards in a starting hand. Uh, typically what you're looking for with that, with those four extra cards, you're hoping to get m more location pullers um, to get your activation platform up and running faster. And then you're typically going to try and play more on your opponent's sites. Uh, we see him use double back right away as well. Sometimes they will run some decks. You'll see run one or two copies of this because it can pull four lom. And what they're getting with it is usually the virtual four lom who acts kind of like three PO, where you put a card in your use pile and draw a card off your reserve deck. It helps you cycle through more cards in your deck, so it helps you see things faster to uh, to get to your activation and to get thin out your characters and get them into your hand and put back your high destiny uh, interrupts and effects and things that uh, you might not need in order to draw them for battle destiny later. So he's going to double back as his first action of the game. He does get the four lom that we were just mentioning. Once per turn, place a card from hand on bottom of use pile. And we'll get a look there as he uses a rebel leadership to pull Akbar. Now we get a sonic bombardment pull to get the security tower. So he said getting one of those pullers to get the 2-0 right away. And we're going to see Apollyon uses a rescue in the clouds. And see all these cards that just cycle through, uh, help cycle through your deck to get the stuff you want into your hand and uh, get yourself up and running pretty fast. So he peaked at three cards. Uh, he took the site. He had the choice between Lando and Relatively Unprotected. Relatively Unprotected is not really going to do anything in this matchup. Uh, and it's a nice seven to have floating around in your deck. Uh, he could have taken Lando um, as another character. He's got four characters in his hand already. Um, if he wants to flip faster, which is certainly a valid uh, thing to do, taking the site is the right move. Because then he can pull one with the objective, and then he's got one in hand already. So like if he gets the 1-0, the and then he's got this site, and he has the docking bay if he needs it as well already in hand, uh, he could easily flip, and then there should only be one other site floating around in the deck. And of course, I will take this time to remind you guys, of course, about the continuing subscription incentives for the PC Twitch channel. That top little right button. So be sure and subscribe or renew your subscription. Uh, once you hit your 3, 6, and 12 month anniversaries, uh, there are special foils for you. Uh, three months was the Grand Inquisitor. Six months was Ezra. I handed out a couple of those at the Match Play Championships. Uh, to the people who had already reached those milestones and uh, we'll be mailing them out to, to the people who have uh, submitted their links uh, their screenshots uh, in the coming weeks um, I should be getting the April OCS foils in about two weeks and then I'll mail out uh, February March and April together to the people who did not attend uh, the MPC this last weekend a lot of people who were in who people who were at the event got them handed out and everybody else will get them mailed out in mid-May once we get uh, the April foils uh, from Kevin over in England. And in Kevin's honor, I'm having an evening cup of tea. So Hunt Down's going to do Hunt Down things. They usually run two to three copies of I Am Your Father to help get the lightsaber and stuff out, which doesn't set them back because it's a Destiny 6 effect. They get six force because of the icons that light side gives up, and they go to the site right away. Sorry. Um, typically, if you're playing against an aggressive dark side deck like uh, Hunt Down, you don't want to start Leia's site as your site because you don't want them going there. 
you want to pull that as your first site so that way you can deploy Leia cheap there and not have Leia possibly stuck in front of their character like Vader. Um, if he was going to try to flip right now and he were to de you know, deploy Leia right here, there's a possibility, of course, that she could get barriered. Now, of course, he doesn't have the force available um, to do it, so it's not a bad play. It doesn't work out uh, poorly, but um, you know, a lot of times you will see people will start this site, the West Gallery, instead, which is also a 2-1, four strain minus one, but then that gives you the ability to then pull the guest quarters, put that on the other side, make them come to that, and then you can slap Leia over there nice and cheap to help set up your flip, um, instead of having to put Leia in front and possibly move away and deal with uh, shenanigans like that. Just another uh, school of thought there. Docking bay to the outside. He's going to match. Damn, trying to catch that. Uh, if you have the cards in your hand, it will show them along the top, so it looks weird. I think I've shown that in previous shows. Um, Harksef, Overseer. This is also another benefit um, to the quick flip. If a Dark Jedi or Sith was just deployed to a related site, may deploy from Reserve Deck a related location. So against a deck like Huntdown, which has lots of Dark Jedis or Siths who are going to come take over your sites, if you do the quick flip and you missed a site and still have one or two floating around in your deck, uh, the Overseer can assist you with getting those out because it's a weird thing where you're deploying stuff during their deploy phase. So you get your extra locations out, which not only boosts your activation when it's your turn, but it also helps you get them out of the deck that you need to. Uh, this looks like he is going to go for the quick flip here. Uh, we're going to see Radis for free. And then possibly yeah, he's going to use Leia for minus two. That'll set up the flip. He just realized the uh, what you have to do, you have to control two Cloud City sites to flip. So he deployed her here for two less. Luckily, there was nothing that restricted him from moving. Um, and then he used the text on the upper plaza corridor. It says, during your move phase, you may move free between here and any Cloud City site. This is very similar to the Spaceport Street, which you'll see in Ral Ops decks. Um, it's very similar text, bouncing your guys around for free between here so they can move to there from free and then when they move away back to one of these other sites that's also free. Uh, we'll probably see Radis move over here as well in just a second. Yep. And he's gonna go one step further which I don't necessarily think is necessary here. Um, against a deck that had a bit more space I would agree with this move land the Overseer, and then bounce Harksef over there so he's safe so the Har Overseer doesn't get battled and overflowed. Huntdown is not known for playing a lot of space. Um, it's also turn two, so you, he'd have to open hand some type of space-ship combination of stuff. Um, and that is fairly unlikely, so I don't necessarily know that he needed to do this land-Overseer combination uh, against Huntdown. You know, the ship is power three, you can put Hark in it, who adds two, so it's power five. It's immune to less than six at Bespin, and it adds destiny to total power. So you add a destiny to power, we'll say it's a three, so you're power eight and you're immune to less than six. That's pretty solid. And for Darkseid to have to commit a, a number of resources to the Bespin system from their opening hand uh, is unlikely, so I don't necessarily agree with this move here. Um, I probably would have left the Overseer there for the turn. Especially because if you control opponent's characters and vehicles, deploy plus one to Cloud City locations, making them pay plus one force for each guy when they want to come take over your sites uh, is also a great benefit. And like I said before, it helps you pull out the other site as well. Thank you very much, CRG, for that. He 
know, the, uh, the outpouring from people has been pretty spectacular. So it's a pretty special moment, and uh, thank you guys for sharing it, sharing it with me. Oh, so now we got Crush. I'm going to pause for a second again. We all know what Crush does, where it does this thing uh, where it gets a Heavy Now or Evader or it cancels Clash of Sabres. There's this other little middle thing in here. At mobile sites, opponent draws no more than two Battle Destiny per battle. This almost never comes up, but in weird games like this, where you know you might see like a Rebel Leadership or like Isla and Lando and some other people uh, all together... You jackass. Kitty's being very nosy and making quite a bit of ruckus. I might have to throw him out in a minute. Um, but yeah, there is that extra little bonus text on Clash that we don't, on uh, on Crush, that we don't always quite get to see. Uh, may not come in handy, but uh, you never know what uh, interrupts. Uh, QMC might be running. Sometimes you do see some things that, uh, or people... Ray and Solo and things who combo together to add destinies. Oh. And we see he, he peeled the card out of his force pile and uh, he's running the new Luke card we haven't seen too much uh, of yet. I know people are still looking for a good home for it. Uh, QMC may not be a bad one. Never deploys to a site opponent occupies. That's fine. You've got six other ones to choose from. Um, yeah, don't care about that. There is no force projection yet. During battle, may cancel an opponent's just-drawn destiny to cause a redraw completely immune to attrition. That's a pretty good way to, uh, to lock down a site and start setting up celebration retrieval. You're completely immune to attrition, and if they draw... A good destiny, you can at least make them redraw it. Maybe they miss the second time around. Whether that's uh, a weapon, a duel, uh, some type of trying to capture him with a hidden weapons or something. It's just during battle. So there's a number of things that uh, that this could work on. So interesting character, Last Jedi Luke, and uh, goes over a common card. So he is an easily accessible Luke as well. Of course, one of the downsides of Luke is I have you now. Because I have you now just says, oh, haha, <laughs> I have you now. It also doesn't work against this Luke, does it now? Because I have you now says if Dark Jedi and a rebel of ability greater than two are involved in the same battle, add a destiny. Add two if rebel is Luke. Last Jedi Luke isn't a rebel. He's just a Jedi Master. So, I have you now, doesn't work against him. At least it shouldn't. Maybe we'll get to see how this plays out, but... Uh, yeah, the conventional thinking of, hey, I just pull I have you now, and uh, Vader goes and beats up on Luke, is not how that goes. Now we'll see if he moves some people around. Yep, he's going to move Radis over. That's unusual. So he just moves Radis to Luke. Leaves Leia and Harksef still sitting over here. I mean, Hutch did draw a few more cards. Um, and he hasn't prioritized finding his other spaceships. Because we know he's running. Um, if he's got Akbar, then he's got home one. Um... And Mirax probably means a uh, Pulsar Skate, probably a booster in Pulsar Skate uh, ship. But he hasn't drawn any of them out of his force pile. And he is going to cancel that drain again. So what Leia does, which is why she's so broken, twice per game, place top card of Lost Pile on top of Reserve Deck to cancel the force drain at a related site. So it's not Retrieval. And the cards you just lost to Visage, you get back, um, and you cancel the drain at the same time. So, 
Oh, he's also got launch in the assault over here, so he could use launching to go get that home one. And there comes Maul and the Phantom Menace. So Phantom Menace makes Maul completely immune to attrition while he is with a Jedi. It also makes him defense value plus two. And then when he leaves the table, you put the effect in the use pile, so you get your seven destiny uh, effect back in your deck to track around. And the card I kept talking about earlier, Keep Your Eyes Open, is going to come into play here. This is the one that prevents battle just initiated. Lose a force to prevent all weapons from being fired for remainder of battle. So no weapons can be used, so it's just going to be Destiny. Now, Phantom Menace makes him completely immune to attrition, but we see him draw a 5 there, which is pretty solid, and he is going to use the loop text, which is a good move to try and redraw that. You're hoping he's going to draw lower than 5. Bam! He draws a sight. That's exactly how that's supposed to work out, right? So now your opponent draws a zero. You don't have to lose anything. All right, you only draw a one, so they're just going to peel a card uh, to keep Maul around. But you don't have to lose anybody. You get to keep Radis, which you never know might come in handy later. And Hutch is going to lose that sight, so he doesn't end up drawing it again because he certainly isn't going to need it. And Apollyon is going to go dig out his Hujix. He should also use Launch in the Assault to grab his home one, since we just saw it in his reserve deck and we know that it's there. But he does not. And he top decks a card off the top of his reserve deck. All right, there goes Maul Sith Infiltrator. Yeah, I mean, Darkseid does usually run some space, whether it's an Infiltrator with Maul or a Shuttle Package or something. But... See, and this this all goes back to what I was saying earlier. By not having Harksef here, he now has to use his force pile pulls to get his sights out of his deck. If Harksef was there when he deployed Maul, Maul could have pulled, uh, the Overseer would have let him pull this site, which he then could have stuck over here. These guys could then bounce over to that site, and this site lets you cancel force drains at Cloud City locations um, far away from the best characters that he's just committed to the ground. So that's the importance of getting Hark Seth at that system and getting him, you know, you got to give him some backup fairly quickly, no denying that. Uh, I also don't agree with where this site was placed. This site should be over here, as far away from his characters as possible, because, of course, you don't want him to control it, because then he can cancel your drains. Uh, or if he blocks you... So I'm not... Uh, There's a few things so far that I would have done differently. I'm not the best QMC player in the world. Uh, far from it. It's not a deck I enjoy playing because it tends to just avoid your opponent as much as possible. And, uh, you know, um, if I'm going to fight, uh, I'd like to just, let's fight. Let's get it over with. Um, I don't want to run away from you for, f you know, 15 minutes until you just get tired of chasing me. Um I mean, yes, there is some strategy involved in that, and of course, you know, it doesn't matter how you win the fight as long as you win, right? But, uh, I don't know. This just... QMC's always been a deck that just feels a little... boring to me. It's like, you don't interact with them, you just keep moving away from them, and they just keep deploying and deploying and deploying until finally they tire themselves out, you know? And then you just push them over, and they fall out and lose. So he bounces Leia over in front of Maul and moves Luke. And Radis away. I'm confused. I'm not sure where that line of play is going. He basically just committed to playing as Hujix to suicide as Leia. I'm not sure what he was thinking there. If he was thinking that he was just going to Hujix it and use her to block a drain of one, 
or if he was thinking that, um, you know, Leia says unless a non-alien character present, that their total ability at the same site is zero, thinking perhaps Maul was an alien or maybe misread what she said. And here's another curious thing. The odin Nestler first aid combo. If your character's about to be hit, use a force free if by a permanent weapon, which is what Maul is. Maul's got a permanent weapon. Prevent forfeit from being reduced. Character's immune to Dr. E for remainder of turn. So Leia just got hit. She's forfeit seven. He doesn't play the interrupt. I disagree with that. Playing the interrupt lets you keep her forfeit of seven. That means there's a fairly good chance, if you, depending on how well you draw, uh, it's 10 to 3, the difference being 7 of all of Leia's forfeit, you may not need to play your Hujix. You might get to save that for another day. Dark Side draws a 5. If you draw a 3 or a 4, it might be worthwhile to just peel one or two cards uh, instead of burning the Hujix. By not playing this, you guarantee that you have to play the Hujix. Maybe he's thinking he's going to save this for later. He's going to need it for a later time when Dr. E shows up and his opponent might grab it. But those are usually the battles where you play the keeping your eyes open or you play the path to move people away. So I would have played the odin Nestler combo here and given myself the option of saving the Hujix. He draws Ray again. So if he had played it, he'd be peeling four cards. You don't know you're going to draw a ray. I mean, you could draw better than that. But to be honest, Leia shouldn't have been there to begin with. Not really sure what the uh, purpose of moving her to that site was. Darkseid doesn't mind losing Maul. Darkseid actually wants to lose Maul because then they can redeploy him in battle again. Uh, Darkseid wants to keep using Maul to churn through all of Lightseid's characters. Um, they're going to let Vader, Dooku, the Emperor, they're going to let you know those guys stick around on the sites. Maul is going to be their, you know, their hit and run meat wagon where he's going to do all the heavy lifting. Now we're now we're going to see Hark work his way over and take off. And he's going to add a commission to cancel Visage. That's good. That, that, that'll that protect him from taking the ping damage every turn, slow the game down a little bit. He's going to put Walkling out of play to retrieve it. Uh, that way, in case his opponent gets uh, the Visage back or has a second copy, which a lot of Hunt Down decks do play at least one other copy. Um, there are some that don't, but some do. Most do. Still doesn't move Hark. Uh, that would have been the perfect opportunity to move Hark Seth. Not sure again why uh, Hark is still sitting there at the upper plaza corridor by himself, begging for some type of dark side spy uh, to come smash him in the face. No barrier. Hujix has already been used. No path. This is just like, hey, Probot, hey, Von A, someone please come kill me and end this game. So uh, curious plays here by Apollyon, I will say that. Um, maybe there's a particular line of thinking he had going in his head. But he can use the text on the sites. He'll cancel the drain at the guest quarters by paying a force from this site. This is his most important site. Then there's the drain of two out here at the downtown plaza. He doesn't play. It's a hit. That I can see. I'm sure he's worried about Ellis. 
I'm sure that's what he's thinking, is that he's worried about Ellis Hellrot moving one of these guys over to Harkseth site. So he's saving the it's a hit under the fear of Ellis, because this type of 12-card throne room could easily play one copy or two copies of Ellis Hellrot, because not every light side, uh, more and more light sides uh, are not playing the Insurrection Aim High combo. It's really just like uh, the throne room type mains, um, and occasionally you'll see it in like Diplo or something like that. They'll run it to boost their guy's forfeit. They'll run the, the non-combo version of Insurrection. Um, but there's a, a lot of the more popular light decks right now uh, are not starting that. So Hunt Down could easily be running an Ellis. So saving this for that, that I can understand. That makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, he picked, uh, pick, all right, so there's the shuttle. He'll get the golden rod sheet to make him pay for the emperor. This would be another benefit of having Hark Seth in space. <laughs> if Hark was in space right now, he would have, take Ray, thank God, Stop drawing her for destiny. Um, he would have five more power plus an additional destiny to power. Oh, he's not going to battle. He's going to just land the shuttle and get the Emperor out. It's a cheaper way of deploying the Emperor for free, I guess. Force him to play the shield. Maybe he was trying to bait something out of his hand, or, you know, because, I mean, the shuttle cost three. Looks like they're going to try and do a revert. Yeah, the shuttle cost three. The Emperor would have been free, but the Goldenrod Sheet makes him cost two, so the Emperor still ended up costing five. Not sure what this uh, revert was about, but I guess we'll see what plays out differently. Maul moves over. Vader moves over. He's going to play C around kid. Put a card back. Go dig out another card. Takes the celebration. That's a good one to get. Obviously, that's one you want to get up and running as soon as possible to help set up your retrieval. Because that is how QMC usually wins most of its games. It does little pings, you know, one drain here, one drain there. Um, and it retrieves with Celebration one or two cards. And that's how it just slowly but surely grinds its opponent to death. You know, death by a thousand paper cuts. So that's what we got going on here. So now Luke's going to get a lightsaber, and that certainly changes things up a little bit. And we're going to get Lando as well. Lando has a text to let you go get people from your deck. So we'll let you get Lobot or somebody else if you didn't have them. And deploy to upload a character with Cloud City and Lore. That gets you uh, Lobot, uh, Pusimer, and there's one or two other characters. But I think Yakshit also has Cloud City in his lore. Um, that, you know, a few guys that you might be able to fish out. Uh, but this is the important part of Lando. During battle, use a force to cancel game text of a Dark Jedi, except Vader, Dorsh, um, at same site. So cancel EPP Maul's game text, and suddenly EPP Maul no longer has a weapon. Just, well, he has a weapon, but he just doesn't have the ability to swing his weapon. Um, so he can't swing at any of your guys. You can swing at him. Uh, Isla over here says when she's with two of your aliens, she adds a destiny. Um, so now we're already up to two battle destiny here. Still don't, uh, Radis is there, so that would give him an extra rebel to play the I have you now off of. But uh, still down a significantly uh, large amount of power here. 
and I would expect him to also play Ray this turn, probably to one of these sites, so then he can slap Celebration on the system. And uh, Ray will get him a use pile pull as well. He's going to deploy Kenobi instead. Okay, still not bad. He's still uh, a solid character. Good game text. And here comes our battle. First action should always be Lando here to cancel. Don't get excited and swing your weapon because then that would give him the opportunity to swing back. There's the Destiny Adder. So he adds one, because Radis is there. He only has two Destiny left, though, so he can't swing. He overactivated, didn't leave himself enough if he was going to do all this. That's another misplay. Uh, if he had left himself a couple more cards, that might have hit Maul, and then draw two Battle Destiny on top of it. No, he retrieved the Attic Mission combo. He put Wackling out of play to get that back. Uh, Marines. Dark side draws an eight total. Luke redraws it. So it will be Maul and three cards. Could have been a lot worse for Dark Side if uh, there had been a few extra destiny left for Luke to swing. Harder to hit, granted, with the Phantom Menace out. He does have the Gick, and he does play it anyway. Okay, so that w it ends up not making a difference. Um, but again, it's a game, like, as I've said many times, and as someone, uh, I believe CRG, uh, quoted me in his signature on the forums, uh, Star Wars is a game of making the right decisions, not the game of necessarily, you know, not getting the right results. So um, just because this didn't work out the way it did, it still should have left the Destiny, tried to do the swing, tried to hit Maul, and make him forfeit zero and force your opponent to play the Gick. Um, you know, in that situation there, he could have saved it. He could have, I mean, what did the Gick save him? Two cards. He lost, instead of losing three, he loses this. He could have lost two other cards instead. And now he's going to hit the drain. I guess he's less concerned about uh, Ellis now than he was. Oh, look, and his opponent plays Ellis. <laughs> it's like you didn't play the it's a hit last turn presumably to save it for Ellis and then you're like nah I guess he's not playing Ellis then you play the it's a hit and now he's going to Ellis anyway you know, there's times when you get locked into a particular strategy that you're thinking to yourself I should have abandoned it sooner and then there are times when you abandoned it, just, uh, you know, you had the you had the right course, you just didn't hold steady. And uh, this is going to be uh, very troublesome for Obi. Because he's already hit. He's going to have to lose a force. Obi's going to die. Talk about overkill. <laughs> He can use the Odin combo here to prevent his forfeit from being reduced, so that'll help a little bit. But Tarkin's going to add a Battle Destiny here. And Darkseid still makes them lose a force for the I Am Your Father. He's going to throw away Jin. Of all the cards he could lose, I would think Jin would be the one he would want to keep. And then he's going to exchange 
Ray and Solo to get the Hoochicks out of his Lost Pile. That's a good play. Getting the Hoojix is the good is a good play. It will save him some cards. It looks like they're gonna back this all up, and he's gonna lose things differently. If he's gonna exchange for the Hoojix, then he doesn't need to play the Odin Nesler combo. So maybe that's what they went back and let him fix. So if that's his line that he's playing here, then uh, yeah, that's just uh, overkill doing both. So he's still going to play the first aid combo to prevent his forfeit from being reduced. I'm not sure what we reverted for then. So he adds a Destiny, and now he decides he's not going to swap for the Hoojix. Or did they accidentally go past that and draw Destiny? We're going to get another revert here in a second. Or is he just going to peel nine cards? Oh, because Obi's forfeit isn't reduced. So Obi still forfeit nine, so he doesn't need to even play the Hoojix, so he doesn't need to worry about swapping cards. Because Obi kept his forfeit. So I guess that's what we did. He undid the swap because he realized he wasn't going to need it, or at least calculated he wouldn't need it. I wouldn't have swapped Solo and Ray and kept Chewy. I would have swapped, at least if I was going to swap, I would have swapped other card, uh, these two and kept Ray. Ray's really good. He takes the Odin combo back. But this is what QMC starts to do. Right now, he's doing a drain of one, uh, two here, because launching the assault is on the system, and a drain of two here with these guys at this site. So he's doing four damage, and he's retrieving one card. His opponent is doing drains of two and two that he has to pay for which cost him a total of six force, one of which he can cancel from this site, and a second one, which he could also potentially cancel by looping around the it's a hit or whatnot. So this is where QMC starts to get into that mode where it starts shutting down the damage and mitigating it between the one retrieval, the drain site, and all those things. And this is how QMC kind of stabilizes things out and stays alive. going to go solo Chewy, and this time he did leave enough Destiny. For Chewy to take a shot at the walker, and then for him to draw two battle Destiny. And he draws very well. Now, also interestingly enough, the QMC objective, it may not come into play, but aliens that, uh, in independent starships are immune to attrition less than four. So should Darkseid draw something like Yasein Asard, um, you know, one of these guys might live. And he's going to use the Odin combo again, which means that Chewie very likely might live. Uh, actually, Chewie should live. There should be no reason why Chewie uh, dies here. Because Han retains his forfeit. Hey, there's the It's a Hit.
So we get a 3 and a 5. That gives them a total of 8. 18. Mara covers 7. So there's you know, no reason to try and do something like play heading for the medical frigate to add one with solo or whatnot. Oh, big 7. Darkseid doesn't even lose the battle now. Oh, and I forgot that he put Menace Fades out as well. So Vader's Saber bonus is canceled. So this is just a drain of one. This is a drain of one. He just cleared off the drain two site. So Darkseid's basically not doing any damage next turn. Now he only has one card in hand. He's going to move Hark out to back up Chewie. Okay. Seems reasonable. Keep Chewie at this site. Take the ship, get the lower destiny card out of the deck, since you don't really want either of them at this point. And you'll just pay one and cancel that drain. He made him burn the force to cancel the drain, so he wasn't worried about him having possibly having a barrier or anything. So that's what that move is about. Even though he knew his opponent was going to cancel it, he still made him spend the force to do it because it limited his options for other things. No, you know, type of battle evasion or whatnot. Oh, and we get Tarkin back as well. So I think we're finally going to see these guys pile onto this shuttle and uh, go con try and contest this system here after he takes care of Hark Seth. So that way uh, Hark can't end up in the Overseer up here as well. Chewie gets mad that Mara hit him with her lightsaber. He'll return the favor, because this should be the same... I think it was, what, 5-3 that he drew last time? That should be the it's a hit, right? Yeah. So she's hit. It's a hit, literally. Um, and now... Dark side will have... Or light side will have a slight advantage uh, and power. Possibly cause a little bit of overflow back. Oh, right, yeah, sevens. That's, of course, right? Track that around. Well done, Hutch. Good job tracking uh, your high destiny clump. It's just a four, so that'll be a tie, so everybody dies. And then I'm sure we'll see everybody pile into the shuttle, and they'll take off, because taking off from a docking bay, or landing at a docking bay, is free. So that will cost no force to do it. And then Darkseid won't have to pay to drain anymore. Now they're still significantly being outpowered here. Because this shuttle is only four. Even though they, he gets three Battle Destiny, um, it is not a whole lot of power. And should he find, uh, should Apollyon find a Rebel leadership and limit this to just one destiny, that would be very troublesome. And oh look, there's a rebel. He took Yoda. Yoda does the same. No, Yoda doesn't do the same thing. Yoda does similar things. Because what Yoda says is, neither player may draw more than one battle destiny here. So he limits both sides to one destiny. No force saved. It's hunt down. You know he's got a bunch of high destiny there. Uh, are you really... Worried about a sense or something like that? Take the leadership, limit him to one. You can drop the booster and pulsar skate and ray and have like 20 power and still draw your two battle destiny, which you left two force for, to his one um, and clear most of this off with, you know, battle damage as opposed to attrition. Um, but he takes Yoda. So either he's not battling in space or Yoda's going to go in space. And then he's limiting himself to one at the same time. Of 
Or maybe he's just thinking that he'll just deploy Yoda and then deploy Rey and uh, hope to get lucky and grab the leadership when he deploys Rey. Spend a force for the retrieval. He can throw Yoda out here at this 2-2 site, then play Rey aboard the home one as well. That's not a bad play. Um, he's going to put Yoda in space and limit both of them to one. I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's not the play I would have done. He's still going to win the power difference here, but I would have done it with a rebel leadership. Because then you're causing, you're drawing two to their one. That's going to be a six or a seven, right? Yeah. Now, home one's immune to less than 10, so it doesn't have to lose anything. <sighs> and Darkseid has to lose 10 power, so they pitch Tarkin. See if he peels four cards? Yeah, he peeled four cards. So he lost Tarkin and four cards to keep the shuttle there. I guess he's out of Emperors. So this is where QMC, like we said earlier, starts to pull ahead because they've they've survived the early storm. They've done their bits of retrieval. They've offset little bits of damage. And they've just kind of uh, outpaced their opponents. Vader's going to start the march. But light side's going to continue to just keep pulling ahead here. Now they're doing draining back to draining for two and two and retrieving one. Um, and dark side is doing no damage really to them at all. So they're just going to continue to fall further and further behind. And he can keep looping around the it's a hit because well it eventually will get grabbed. It'll very likely get grabbed the next time he plays it. But yeah, I haven't agreed with a lot of the decisions that Apollyon has made along the way, but he's still ahead and uh, likely to win this game. So kudos to him for finding at least uh, a strategy and an opportunity to win a game. Um. Maybe it's not the, the the one I would have the the course of action I would have taken throughout this game, and maybe it wouldn't have maybe it would have blown up in my face. But Obi to the docking bay. Save those cards. You don't need a lot of times. You don't need to draw at the end of your turn like you normally do because you just go fish out whatever card you need. He's going to change what card he pulled. Barrier's a good card. I would have kept, I'd keep the barrier. Oh, it looks like Hutch wanted to change what he did. I guess maybe he wants to activate more. I think maybe he accidentally passed. Maybe he wanted to activate additional force. Yeah, he does. Okay, so we're just going to go back and change that. Hey, it's that mall guy. Good thing he just picked up a barrier. QMC wins favored matchup against Huntdown. <laughs> yeah, the longer the game goes, the more it tends to favor the QMC deck, I think. Um, you know, when Darkseid hits the ground running and really leans on them and forces them into some rough positions, um, that's when it uh, Huntdown will prevail and, and win those matchups. Um, 
you know, once you let them get flipped and let them start fishing out cards and looping interrupts and stuff around, um, especially if you only have one grabber, it can be uh, difficult because there's usually like three interrupts you want to grab. And whichever one you grab, they just end up looping around the other one or two, whether it's, in this case, it's going to be the it's a hit that he's just going to keep looping to cancel drains for the rest of the game. While possibly retrieving at least one or two force. Yeah, he's just pulling further and further ahead here. But it looks like he's going, he's swinging, he's just going to try and end it right here. Hutch running pretty low on cards. Oh my god, enough with the reverts. It's like the fifth or sixth revert. Did we break it? Yeah, I think we... Now, I think their link may have broken. That's the other problem with reverts is that sometimes the game link gets stuck and breaks during the revert. And uh, you don't get to see the conclusion of the game as a result of that. Well, it's always disappointing when you don't get to see the game finish out the way it's supposed to. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a bold prediction here that the QMC deck wins. Uh, Darth Maul probably gets beat up pretty sizably here. I mean, he's uh, outpowered 20 to <laughs> 7. Because she's power plus 1 for each opponent's character, so she's a 5, so there's a 10, 13, 14, 15, 16 with Yaxjit. Uh And then if Chewie comes back down like he should, uh, that would be 22. And swing, hit, shoot, hit, something, make him probably, even if you don't make him forfeit zero, you're still ahead by 15, just in the straight power, and you're getting two destiny to his one. Uh, Maul's going to cover seven, so you're down eight plus the difference between the destiny draws, and Hutch only has 11 cards left total. So this is going to be your game-ending beatdown battle here, uh, which took nine turns for light side to move around and set up and manipulate, which is what QMC does. It's a control deck. It's not an aggro deck. Uh, if you like control decks, QMC is a good one for you to play. If you like aggro decks, QMC will drive you nuts. So that will be our game review for the day. Let's pop back over here. Looks like people missed out on their games. So uh, April is officially over. We are now into May. Looks like we're starting the May time there. Gornal, yay! Subscribe for five months. Thank you very much for that. One more month, and you will hit your six months, and you will get your Ezra Bridger foil. Uh, be sure to, if I happen to catch it when you're, if you're, you know, you renew during a live stream, which you're certainly likely to do. Um, if you uh, happen to renew when we're not online, just be sure and uh, submit the screenshot and we'll make sure to get you your foils. Uh, that goes the same for everybody else, of course. Top right corner, subscribe. Even if you don't subscribe, make sure to follow along to us as well. Um, and then there's a few other pages at the bottom. Uh, both myself, Wise, and now Dan uh, have been streaming games and things like that. So there are some... I gotta update that picture. Uh, I got a Hall of Fame picture trophy now. <laughs> Um, I'll change that out later. Uh, we do have our own Twitch pages where we do stream uh, live games. Wise has been streaming all of his games for the OCS, uh, 12 games a month. So plenty of good content there for you to follow along with. And uh, and I'll be streaming some OCS games myself now that the MPC is over. Get back to streaming some Star Wars and uh, all that fun stuff. I think that's going to wrap it up for tonight been going about an hour and 20 minutes here uh, thank you all very much for uh, f joining us in tonight and uh, we'll see you back here in uh, 
sometime next week. Again, still off our usual Monday schedules until Game of Thrones ends in three more weeks. And uh, then I'll be back on the regular Monday schedule once that happens. But uh, you guys take care. Have a great night. Thank you again very much for all the uh, love and support for the Hall of Fame thing. Uh, truly, truly a remarkable moment. And uh, can't really put into words what that means to me. So you guys take care, and uh, we'll see you next week.